Hey guys, welcome back to my channel, The ENT Resident. I'm Dr. Moshmi Das, and today I'll be talking about the anatomy of the middle ear. Now, middle ear is a very long topic to study, so I have divided it into different portions. In today's video, I will be covering about the parts of the middle ear and the walls of the middle ear. So let's start our class now. So starting with our topic today, which is the anatomy of middle ear. In today's class, I will be talking about the different parts of the middle ear and the boundaries of the middle ear. So starting ahead with it, first what we need to know is what is the middle ear cleft. So now middle ear cleft consists of the tympanic cavity or also known as the middle ear cavity, the eustachian tube and the mastoid air cell system. So the picture that you see over here, this whole thing is actually the middle ear cleft. This is the middle ear cavity or the tympanic cavity, this is the eustachian tube and this here is the mastoid air cell system. So the tympanic cavity is actually an irregular air filled space within the temporal bone between the tympanic membrane laterally and the osseous labyrinth medially. So basically the tympanic membrane laterally is separating the middle ear from the external ear which we have already discussed about in the previous classes. And medially, uh, the osseous labyrinth is lying medial to the middle ear, which is basically the inner ear. And the middle ear cleft, it consists of certain structures, which are most importantly the auditory ossicles, the malleus, incus, and the stapes, and the tendons that attach them to the middle ear muscles. Now, as I was telling you, the middle ear cavity is actually an irregular cavity. You will notice over here that because of the convexity of the medial wall and the concavity of the lateral wall. So convexity of the medial wall meaning the promontory you can see over here this is forming the medial wall. You can see how convex this, this wall is whereas laterally it is bounded by the tympanic membrane and you can see it is concave towards the middle ear cleft. Now because of this reason the middle ear cavity is actually constricted in the center. So you can see over here this region is constricted that compared to the top and the bottom of the middle ear cavity. So if you were to look at the width of the middle ear cavity, it is 2 millimeter at the center which is at the umbo, 6 millimeter superiorly in the attic region and 4 mm inferiorly in the hypotympanum region. So we can see that the middle ear cavity is the widest in the attic, it is the thinnest at the center and in between in the hypotympanum. Also, the vertical and the anteroposterior length of the middle ear cavity measures about 15 millimeter. And if someone were to ask you about the volume of the middle ear, it would be 1 to 2 centimeter cube of air. And a little important factoid over here is the minimum volume of air which is necessary for normal functioning of the middle ear is at least a 0.5 centimeter cube. Moving on to the relations of the middle ear cleft. So if we were to look at the middle ear and the uh, what are the different relations on all the six walls, we will see superiorly it is related to the middle cranial fossa and the temporal lobe which occupies it. Inferiorly it is separated from the jugular bulb and the carotid artery. Laterally as I told you the tympanic membrane separates it from the external auditory meters. Medially it is uh, related to the inner ear. Anteriorly, it has two openings which is related to the tensor tympani muscle and the eustachian tube and posteriorly it comes in contact with the mastoid air cell system and it communicates with the mastoid antrum via the aditas to the mastoid. So these are the six relations of the middle ear cleft. And before we start talking about the boundaries, we are first going to talk about the different parts of middle ear. So we can divide the middle ear into mostly three portions. The first is the mesotympanum. Mesotympanum is that part of the middle ear which is lying opposite to the pars tensor of the tympanic membrane. In my video where I discussed about the uh, anatomy of the tympanic membrane, I have told you about how it consists of two parts. One is pars flaccida and one is pars tensor. So this whole region over here is the pars tensor. So the portion of the middle ear cavity which is lying just opposite to the pars tensor is the part which, which we call as the mesotympanum and above it lies the epitympanum or the attic region. 
So, this part is getting limited above the level of the malleolar folds, but medial to the shrapnel's membrane and the bony lateral attic wall. As you can see, this portion here, it is the pars flaccida, also known as the shrapnel's membrane. And this here is the lateral bony attic wall. So, this region is forming the lateral boundary of the epitympanum or the attic region. And thirdly, the lower portion is known as the hypotympanum, which basically lies below the level of the inferior part of the tympanic sulcus. So, anything that lies below this level, this region is known as the hypotympanum. Now, the portion of middle ear, which is around the tympanic orifice of the eustachian tube, is sometimes also called as protympanum. As I was telling you, the anterior wall over here, as you can see over here, the eustachian tube, this is present in the anterior wall of the middle ear cavity. This around this region, the portion of the middle ear that is present, that is known as protempanum. Now, talking about individually about all the different parts of the middle ear, first we will start with the epitympanum or the attic. It is that portion of the middle ear which is lying above the level of the short process or the lateral process of the malleus. It lies within this dehiscence in the tympanic bone which is known as the notch of rivenous. Now, when I told you about the anatomy of the tympanic membrane, I have told you about the dehiscence which is known as the notch of rivenous and how in that region the pars flaccida is present. So, if we were to look at the boundaries of the epitympanum, we would see that the roof is formed by the tegment tympani. The anterior boundary is formed by the tympanosquamous suture line, the posterior boundary by the tympanomastoid suture line. Laterally, as I already showed you in the picture, it is formed by the pars flaccida and the bony outer attic wall. And medial wall is formed by a portion of the medial wall of the mesotympanum, which lies just above the level of the facial canal. So, this you can see over here, this here is the lateral wall and this here is the medial wall of the epitympanum. The lateral wall as you can see consists of the pars flaccida and the bony lateral attic wall. Now, the contents of the epitympanum include the head of the malleus, the body of the incus and the associated ligaments and the mucosal folds in between them. So, you see over here, this is the head of the malleus which lies in the attic and this is the body of the incus which lies in the attic. So, these are the main contents of the epitympanum. And the th third thing you need to know over here is a structure known as the cog. Now, what is the cog? Cog is basically a bony ridge which hangs from the tegmen, that is which is the roof of the epitympanum, just anterior to the head of the malleus. It lies immediately above and slightly posterior to the post processus cochleariformis. Now, why do we really need to know about this cog is the fact that it divides the anterior epitympanum from the rest of the epitympanum. So, it is basically a bony ridge extending from the roof which is the tegmen just anterior to the head of the malleus and it divides the attic into an anterior tympanum and the posterior epitympanum. Next, we move on to mesotympanum. Now, mesotympanum as I already told you, it is that part of the middle ear which is lying opposite to the pars tensa. What are the contents of the mesotympanum? As you can see in the picture right over here, they are the stapes, long process of incus, oval window, the round window. Now, the eustachian tube exists, ex exits from the anterior aspect of the mesotympanum and as I already told you that portion of the middle ear is also known as the protympanum, the part over here, this region is also known as the protympanum. And uh, important uh, two spaces are available in this mesotympanum, they are the facial recess and sinus tympanum, these lie in the posterior wall of the mesotympanum, this is something I will be coming back to you later when I discuss about it. And lastly is the hypotympanum. So, the hypotympanum is that portion of the middle ear cavity which is lying below the level of the bony ear canal. Now, uh, I told you before that the floor is related to the internal jugular vein and the internal carotid artery. It is separated from it by this thick plate of bone over here you can see. So, sometimes what happens is this uh, floor may be dehiscent and then that leads to the exposure of the jugular bulb to the middle ear cavity. This is important in, uh, in cases uh, where we are doing surgery of the mastoid.
and there might be a high jugular bulb or the, there might be a jugular bulb that is barely covered by just a mucosal membrane. So, in those cases we have to be careful so as not to injure it during surgery. So, now we start the boundaries about the middle ear cavity. So, there are six walls of the middle ear cavity, a superior wall, an inferior wall, anterior, posterior, medial and lateral. So, we are going to discuss each one of them one by one. First, starting with the lateral wall. So, lateral wall as I have already told you, it is formed mostly by the tympanic membrane, but that is not it. We need to know more about it. So, the lateral wall is partly bony and it is partly membranous. It is formed by the bony lateral wall of the epitympanum superiorly, which is this portion over here. This is the bony lateral wall of the epitympanum. Then, tympanic membrane centrally, which is over here, and the lateral wall, bony lateral wall of the hypotympanum inferiorly, which is this portion. So, you can see it is not just the tympanic membrane which is forming the lateral wall of the middle ear. So, now discussing about the outer attic wall. This is actually a part of the squamous bone. It is a wedge shaped plate of bone which separates the attic from the zygomatic mastoid cells laterally. Now, uh, here a very important structure you have to know about is something known as the scutum. So, what is scutum? Scutum is basically the portion of the attic outer wall which lies below the plane tracing the roof of the external auditory canal. So, if you see over here, in this picture, this region here is the scutum. So, scutum is basically it is a thin sharp bony spur which is formed by the junction of the attic outer wall and the superior wall of the external auditory canal. So, you can see this bony portion it is actually located at the junction of the lateral outer uh, attic wall and the superior wall of the external auditory canal, a sharp bony spur which is projecting from this junction and this scutum forms part of the superior deep portion of the external meatus and it gives attachment to the pars flaccida of the tympanic membrane which is forming the lateral wall of the prusac space. So, you see in the CT scan over here, this structure right over here, the bony spur you can see this is the scutum and uh, why we need to know about scutum is that in cholesteatoma, scutum is one of the parts which is actually eroded. So, in CT scan what we should look for is whether there is erosion of the scutum. In the second picture over here you can see that here the scut this is not a sharp bony spur anymore. You can see that there has been some erosion of the scutum. So, this is what is important for us clinically when we are looking at the CT scan. So, uh, coming to the clinical importance of the scutum, it is the first bony structure to be eroded by an atical cholesteatoma secondary to a pars flaccida retraction pocket. And secondly, it is a very thin structure. So, it is very easily eroded leaving behind a telltale sign on the coronal HRCT. And now, since we have completed uh, the bony attic wall, what we need to know about the different openings in this lateral wall of the middle ear. These are known as the tympanic canaliculi. So, the medial surface of the tympanic ring near the tympanic spines they present with three openings. The petrotympanic fissure also known as the glaciarian fissure. Second is the canal of Huguier or the anterior canaliculus for corda tympani. And third is the posterior canaliculus for corda tympani. So, discussing the first, the important fissure known as a petrotympanic fissure, we also call it a glissarian fissure. This is basically a fissure which opens anteriorly just above the attachment of the tympanic membrane. You can see over here, this, this is the glissarian fissure, the first opening over here. This is the glissarian fissure. It is a slit which is about 2 millimeter long and what are the structures it uh, receives and transmits, it is important to know. It receives the anterior malleal ligament and it transmits the anterior tympanic artery, which is a branch of the internal maxillary artery to the tympanic cavity. So, basically two structures are passing through this petrotympanic fissure. One is the anterior malleal ligament, second is the anterior tympanic artery. The next canaliculi is the canal of Huguier, also known as the anterior canaliculus for the corda tympani. Now, this is a separate canaliculus which is present just medial to the petrotympanic fissure in the anterior wall. 
Through this uh, canal, the cauda tympani leaves the tympanic cavity towards the infratemporal fossa. So, if you see in this picture here, the second opening over here, this is the canal of Hugia. What it is doing is it is transmitting the cauda tympani but through which it is leaving the tympanic cavity and going towards the infratemporal fossa. And thirdly is the posterior canaliculus which is situated medial to the posterior tympanic spine. So, this is basically the only uh, the first two canaliculus I talked about is located in the anterior wall and this third canaliculus or posterior canaliculus is located in the posterior wall. It lies at the junction between the posterior and the lateral walls of the middle ear. It lies immediately medial to the tympanic membrane at the level of the upper limit of the malleus handle. And this also transmits one structure which is basically the cauda tympani nerve. So, through this canal the cauda tympani nerve exists to enter the tympanic cav cavity. Now, this canal descends in front of the facial nerve canal and it opens into it 6 millimeter above the stylomastoid foramen. You can see in the picture over here, this here is the posterior canaliculus. So, the cauda tympani is basically exiting through this canaliculus to enter the tympanic cavity. And once it has gone into the tympanic cavity, it continues as a in a bony canal which joins it. This is a facial nerve canal. It joins the facial nerve canal just 6 millimeter above the stylomastoid foramen. So, these are the three important canaliculi you need to know and what are the structures they transmit. Next, we move on to the floor of the middle ear. So, the floor is basically very narrow and it consists of a very thin plate of bone that separates the middle ear from the jugular bulb posteriorly and the internal carotid artery anteriorly. You can see in the picture over here, this right here, the arrow pointed here is the floor and you can see posteriorly lies the jugular vein or the jugular bulb and anteriorly lies the internal carotid artery. And in the bone between the carotid artery canal and the jugular bulb fossa near the medial wall opens a very small canal which is known as the inferior tympanic canaliculus. Now this inferior tympanic canaliculus is located near the fossa fossula petrosa and it houses the inferior ganglion of the glossopharyngeal nerve. Now you can see over here uh, the place I have uh, marked over here in green this part is the inferior tympanic calculus which lies in between the jugular bulb fossa and the internal carotid artery. What is the importance of it is that it transmits the tympanic branch of the glossopharyngeal nerve which is also known as the Jacobson's nerve and also the second structure it transmits is the inferior tympanic artery which is a branch of the ascending pharyngeal artery. So, both of these structures enter through this canaliculus into the middle ear cavity. So, this is about the floor of the middle ear. Next, coming to the clinical importance of the floor, as I was telling you before, there might be cases where the floor is dehiscent and it is getting exposed to the jugular bulb. This is very important to know. So, the first clinically important part is what I just discussed. In these cases, what happens is the jugular bulb is only covered by a fibrous tissue and a mucous membrane. So, it is not really protected by a hard plate of bone. So, when the jugular bulb is absent, the bulb may protrude into the middle ear cavity which is classified as the dehiscent jugular bulb. And second, this is the first one that you know. So, if you, if you were to look into the CT scan picture I have attached over here, you can see on this side, this is the jugular bulb and you can see there is a thin plate of bone covering the jugular bulb. Whereas, on this side you can see the thin plate of bone is dehiscent. So, the jugular bulb is exposed to the middle ear cavity. The second thing we need to know about is the high riding jugular bulb. So, the high riding jugular bulb may obliterate the round window recess in some cases and it may be visualized otoscopically as a blue mass behind the tympanic membrane. So, sometimes what happens is the jugular bulb uh, is not present at its normal level, it goes a little higher up and in those cases like here for instance, if this were to be present like this, we would call it as a high jugular bulb and some uh, this will be visualized through the tympanic membrane as a blue mass. Next, we move on to the posterior wall of the middle ear. 
The posterior wall is the highest wall of the middle ear and it measures about 14 millimeters. It is formed essentially by the petrous bone and it is wider above than it is below. And the posterior wall is separating the middle ear from the mastoid air cells except at the area of the aditus ad antrum where the bone is deficient and it permits a communication between the attic and the mastoid antrum. So you can see over here these, the, this region is all the mastoid air cells and this is our posterior wall of the middle ear cleft. You can see throughout the wall there is a bony lining only in the superior portion this region you can see there is a communication between the attic in front and, the, and this is basically known as the aditus. Aditus is basically the communication in between the middle ear and the middle ear cavity which is uh, the attic in front and behind with the mastoid air cells. The posterior wall can be divided into two distinct parts. The upper third which corresponds to the aditus ad antrum as you can see over here this is the aditus ad antrum and it represents the posterior limit of the epitympanum and the lower two third is formed by the posterior wall of the retrotympanum. And the two parts these two parts they are separated by the incudal buttress which is a compact bone that runs laterally that uh, runs from the tympanic ring laterally to the lateral semicircular canal medially. And this, this incudal buttress is the region which houses the incudal fossa to lodge the short process of the incus and its suspensory ligament. So we see in this picture over here the upper one third is formed by the aditus and the lower two third is formed but is basically corresponding to the posterior wall of the retrotympanum. And what lies in between is basically the incudal buttress which houses the incudal fossa and what lodges in this incudal fossa is the short process of the incus and its suspensory ligament. So uh, discussing about the aditus at antrum, it, the aditus is basically uh, connecting the epitympanum of the middle ear to the mastoid antrum posteriorly. This here you can see is the communication. And it is a triangular shape with a dimension of 4 into 4 into 4 millimeter. And the lower part of the posterior wall as we were seeing, it is basically a complete bony wall extending from the bony annulus of the tympanic ring to the bony labyrinth medially. It houses the vertical segment of the facial nerve. And it is also the extension of the styloid eminence upward to the pyramidal eminence and to the level of the fossa incutus. Now this posterior wall has a lot of important structures. This wall as I was telling you is wider above than below. It presents with three eminences which are directed anteriorly, seven bony ridges and four sinuses and spaces which is delimiting the retrotympanum compartment. Now this portion over here it is not important for the undergraduates at all but this is uh, very important to learn for all the postgraduates out there. So the three eminences on the posterior wall are the pyramidal eminence, caudal eminence and the styloid eminence. The seven bony ridges are the caudal ridge, pyramidal ridge, styloid ridge, ponticulus, subiculum, fustis and funiculus. And between all these bony ridges and the eminences there are four sinuses which can be divided into the lateral and the medial spaces. So the lateral sinuses are mostly the facial sinus and the lateral tympanic sinus. And the medial sinuses are the posterior tympanic sinus and the sinus tympani. So now I will be discussing in details about the different eminences, the different bony ridges. This is strictly only for the postgraduates to understand. So first we will start with the pyramidal eminence. The pyramidal eminence is situated at the center of the posterior wall immediately behind the oval window. You can see in the picture over here, this right here is the pyramidal eminence. And you can see it is located just behind the oval window. This is the oval window here. This is just an eminence situated at the center of the posterior wall. This whole part is the posterior wall. And you can see how it is situated in the center of the posterior wall immediately behind the oval window. It is about 2 millimeter in height and its base is getting fused with the canal of the facial nerve. You can see over here. This right here is the canal of the facial nerve. So you can see how the pyramidal eminence the posteriorly is getting fused 
with the canal facial nerve canal and the importance of the pyramidal eminence is that it lodges the body of the stapedial muscle and it helps in giving passage to the stapedial tendon through its apex and the stapedial tendon after passing through its apex attaches itself to the neck of the stapes in front this pyramidal eminence it communicates with the facial bony canal by a very minute aperture which transmits the stapedial branch of the facial artery so basically this is a facial nerve canal and right in the center of it lies the pyramidal eminence which is a triangular structure like this and what it is saying is that within the pyramidal eminence uh, it lodges the stapedial muscle and through the apex of it the stapedial muscle is uh, stapedial tendon escapes and it gets attached to the neck of the stapes like this and as you can see here in this region it by a minute aperture from the facial nerve canal it gives off a stapedial branch of the facial nerve which is coming from here and then it supplies the muscle in this region so this is the importance of the pyramidal eminence next we move on to the caudal eminence the caudal eminence is situated lateral to the pyramidal eminence and it is 1 mm medial to the tympanic membrane so the caudal eminence it shows a foramen which is the posterior canaliculus of the cauda tympani where the cauda tympani passes through so if we were to imagine this say this is the pyramidal eminence if we were to Im imagine it from a uh, anterior posterior point of view and this is the tympanic membrane just 1 mm medial to it lies the caudal eminence so this is the pyramidal eminence this is the caudal eminence and this is the tympanic membrane and this caudal eminence is basically consisting of the posterior canaliculus that we learnt about earlier which helps in passing the cauda tympani you can see in the picture over here this here is the caudal eminence and this here is a pyramidal eminence next we move on to the styloid eminence now the styloid uh, eminence the styloid complex is a derivative of the superior portion of the second branchial arch and it consists of three parts the styloid eminence the styloid peg and the styloid button you don't need to know so much about all of this what you need to know is the styloid eminence it represents a very important landmark for the facial nerve because in in terms an, of anatomic boundaries the styloid eminence is situated always anterior to the facial nerve in the picture over here you can see that this is the styloid eminence and this is the pyramidal eminence so styloid eminence basically is rep is a uh, important landmark for facial nerve identification next we move on to the ridges the first ridge is the caudal ridge of proctor this ridge runs laterally and transversely from the pyramidal eminence to fuse to the caudal eminence so uh, as i have shown you before the pyramidal eminence and the caudal eminence they are like like this lateral to each other so the caudal ridge is basically this ridge over here if you were to imagine it in a more 3d point of view this is a ridge which is extending from the pyramidal eminence over here to the caudal eminence over here next comes the pyramidal ridge pyramidal ridge is a ridge that runs inferiorly from the base of the pyramidal eminence to the styloid eminence so this here and look at this this is the pyramidal eminence over here and this is the styloid eminence over here so this ridge that is running inferiorly from the pyramidal eminence to the styloid eminence is known as the pyramidal ridge whereas say this is a caudal eminence the caudal ridge is a ridge which is running laterally and transversely from the pyramidal eminence to the caudal eminence next is the styloid ridge the styloid ridge is the ridge which uh, connects the styloid eminence to the caudal eminence so if you were to look at this uh, we can see over here if this is the caudal ridge and this is the uh, cord sorry the caudal eminence and this is the styloid eminence a ridge which is connecting both of them this is known as the styloid ridge so these three ridges are interconnecting the these three eminences 
as you can see over here as well this is the pyramidal eminence this here is the styloid eminence and somewhere over here will be the caudal eminence so the, this is one ridge this is one ridge and this is one ridge next we move on to ponticulus ponticulus is a central structure in the retro tympanum it is a bony ridge which extends from the pyramidal process to the promontory there are two variants of the ponticulus so before that first we will see is this structure over here this is a promontory and this is a pyramidal eminence so ponticulus is basically a bony ridge which is connecting the pyramidal eminence with the promontory so this ridge is the ponticulus in the other structures over here also you can see that this is the uh, pyramidal eminence and this is the promontory so this ridge which is connecting both of them this is known as the ponticulus so the ponticulus can be two types a complete ponticulus and an incomplete ponticulus the so complete is when the ponticulus is completely formed and it is connecting both the structures in this case the ponticulus represents the superior boundary of the sinus tympani in this region is the sinus tympani so you can see this this communication is complete between the promontory and the pyramidal eminence in this case it is a complete ponticulus whereas in some cases there might be an incomplete ponticulus where what happens is the ponticulus does not end up connecting the pyramidal process with the promontory and the sinus tympani the second variety is the incomplete ponticulus where what happens is the ponticulus doesn't connect with the pyramidal eminence fully so you can see that there is some dehiscence in between these two it is not fully connected as a result of which what happens is the sinus tympani becomes a confluent sinus with the posterior sinus there is no longer a division in between the two next we move on to subiculum subiculum is a smooth bony projection that is situated posterior to the promontory and it extends from the posterior lip of the round window niche towards the styloid eminence so this here is the subiculum this as you can see it is ex extending from the posterior lip of the round window niche which is this region and it is continuing towards the styloid eminence which is this part so this region is basically the subiculum the subiculum the importance of subiculum is it separates the round window and the oval window and it intervenes between the sinus tympani superiorly and the round window niche inferiorly next we come on to fustis fustis is basically a thick solid bony projection which links the basal turn of the cochlea with the styloid eminence this fustis is actually giving a very strong support to the round window membrane this region over here is known as the fustis you can see this is the round window and fustis is giving strong support to the round window membrane over here and lastly is the funiculus funiculus is a bony ridge which arises from the anterior pillar of the round window and running towards the floor of the hypotympanum separating the inferior retro tympanum from the hypotympanum where the jugular bulb is located so if you see in the picture over here it is running this this is over here is the bony ridge which is known as the funiculus it is running from the posterior anterior pillar of the round window which is here and it running towards the floor of the hypotympanum which is over here and thus it ends up separating this whole region which is the inferior retro tympanum from this whole region which is the hypotympanum so this finishes about the different ridges in the posterior wall now coming to the anterior wall of the middle ear the anterior wall it separates the middle ear cavity from the petrous carotid canal anteriorly so if you were to see in the picture over here this over here is the anterior wall of the middle ear and this region over here is the bony uh, bony wall which covers the internal carotid artery now the anterior wall is the tympanic cavity is very narrow because the medial and the lateral walls of the middle ear cavity they converge anteriorly in a very acute angle so the anterior wall is narrower in comparison to the posterior wall now if we were to look at uh, the different structures of the anterior wall it is actually divided into three portions the lower middle and the upper portion so the first lower portion is basically the largest portion and represents the anterior wall of the hypotympanum
Here what is happening is that the uh, there's a very thin plate of bone which is separating the middle ear cavity over here from the vertical segment of the uh, uh, carotid artery in front. So this plate of bone over here is the forming the lower portion of the anterior wall of the hypotympanum. Now this bony plate has very two very tiny openings to transmit the carotidotympanic nerves from the sympathetic chain which is present all around the internal carotid artery. So the upper opening transmits the superior carotidotympanic nerve and the inferior opening transmits the inferior carotidotympanic nerve. So these nerves they are originating from the sympathetic flexure which is usually present all around the uh, internal carotid artery and they are carrying these sympathetic fibers from here to the tympanic plexus which is forming on the promontory of the middle ear. Next coming to the middle portion of the anterior wall, it corresponds to the pro tympanum. Now this portion has two tunnels placed one below the other. The upper tunnel is transmitting the tensor tympani muscle and the lower tunnel is corresponding to the bony portion of the eustachian tube. If you see in the picture over here, you will notice this is the upper tunnel. It is transmitting the tensor tympani tendon and this here is the lower tunnel which is basically forming the bony portion of the eustachian tube. And there is a very thin plate of bone which is separating these two tunnels and it is known as the septum canalis musculotubarius. This is a very cylindrical semi canal and it lies beneath the tegment tympani and it extends posteriorly to join the cochleariform process. So this is about the middle portion. What you need to remember importantly here is the upper tunnel is uh, transmitting the tensor tympani tendon and the lower tunnel is corresponding to the bony portion of the eustachian tube. And lastly is the upper portion of the anterior wall which corresponds to the root of the zygoma which represents the anterior wall of the epitympanum. Now that's all about the anterior wall. Now we move on to the medial wall of the middle ear. Now this is this medial wall has a lot of important structures in it. So the medial wall of the tympanic cavity is basically separating the middle ear cleft laterally from the adjacent inner ear medially. So the important structures that you need to know are the cochlear promontory, the tympanic segment of the facial nerve, the oval window and the round window, the tensor tympani canal, the cochleariform process and the lateral semicircular canal. So you can see in the picture over here, this here is the lateral semicircular canal, this is the facial nerve canal, this is the oval window, this is the round window, this here is the promontory, this is the cochleariform process over here and this is a tensor tympani canal. These are all the structures of the medial wall of the middle ear. Now the canal of the tensor tympani muscle and anteriorly and the tympanic fallopian canal posteriorly these are the two landmarks which is basically dividing the medial wall into an upper third and a lower two third. So the upper third is forming the medial wall of the epitympanum and it is demarcated posteriorly by the lateral semicircular canal and the lower two third forms the medial wall of the mesotympanum and it consists of the cochlear promontory, oval window and the round window. So if you were to see in this picture over here. Now see in the picture over here, in this uh, tensor tympani muscle and the facial nerve, this in continuity is basically dividing the whole of the medial wall into an upper part, upper one third and a lower two third. So as you can see the upper one third is limited posteriorly by this structure which is the lateral semicircular canal. This part is basically the medial wall of the epitympanum. And the lower part consists of the oval window, round window and the cochlear promontory. The, so coming to the tensor tympani bony canal and the cochleariform process. So the semi canal of the tensor tympani muscle, it extends from the pro tympanum onto the labyrinthine wall of the tympanic cavity and it ends immediately in front of the oval window niche. So the medial wall of the tympanic cavity, it has this very important structure which is basically a bony protrusion uh, from the medial wall laterally called the cochleariform process. This you can see over here, this in this picture over here, this here is the cochleariform process. It is basically a bony projection from the medial wall. This is situated anterior superior to the oval window and just inferior to the tympanic segment of the facial nerve. 
Now the importance of the cochleariform process is that it represents the posterior end of the bony canal of the tensor tympani. If you were to see, look at the picture over here, this region is actually the cochleariform process. It marks the posterior limit of the tensor tympani canal. And this curved projection of the bone is concave anteriorly and it houses the tendon of the tensor tympani muscle. So basically the cochleariform process is helping the tensor tympani muscle to come, uh, come backwards, form a tendon, the tendon slings around the cochleariform process and then it proceeds to get attached to the malleus. So from here the tendon is turning laterally and it is attaching to the medial aspect of the malleus handle. So this cochleariform process importance is that it is the landmark for the position of the turn between the anterolateral and the posteriorly directed horizontal portion of the facial nerve. This cochleariform process also is the termination of the bony septum which separates the eustachian tube from the canal of the tensor tympani muscle. So this slide over here is very important to know what are the clinical importance of cochleariform process. It is the most resistant bony part to cholesteatoma, so it barely ever gets eroded. Secondly, it forms an important landmark for the facial nerve because the facial nerve always lies superior and posterior to the cochleariform process. If you see in this picture over here, this here is the cochleariform process. And you can see how the facial nerve is running superior and posterior to it. Thirdly, the Jacobson's nerve passes perpendicular to the cochleariform process at the hypotympanic level, so it is also forming a useful landmark for the Jacobson neurectomy. Fourth, medial to the cochleariform process, the basal tone of the cochlea ends and the second tone starts. And fifth, the cock is actually situated anterior and superior to the cochleariform process. So this slide is very, very, very important for postgraduates to remember. Next coming to facial nerve canal. It is an important structure in the upper part of the medial wall of the mesotympanum. As you can see in the picture over here, this here is the facial nerve canal. And you can see how it is running obliquely and uh, posteriorly above the oval window. This here is the oval window. And you can see this is running so superiorly and posteriorly in an anterior super posterior direction and it is going down to meet the vertical segment of the facial nerve canal which is situated in the posterior wall. So this portion over here the horizontal segment is basically a part of the medial wall. Now it, uh, this, this uh, division in between these two right over here is the second genu. The second genu is basically the turn in between the vertical and the horizontal segment of the tympanic cavity. The importance of this facial nerve canal is that in the medial wall sometimes the bony canal of the facial nerve could be dehiscent leaving the facial nerve to be only covered by a submucosa or even prolapsing lying over the oval window. So this is important in cases of stapedectomy if there is a deficient facial nerve we have to be very careful while operating or it might lead to damage to the facial nerve fibers leading to facial palsy. Next we move on to the semi lateral semicircular canal. The lateral semicircular canal is the region above the level of the facial nerve canal forming the medial wall of the attic. So you can see this here is the lateral semicircular canal. It is lying posterior to the facial nerve canal and therefore it is forming a medial wall of the attic. Now the dome of the semicircular canal extends a little lateral to the facial canal and is the most prominent structure of the posterior portion of the epitympanum. So this here is the lateral semicircular canal. This is an operative picture taken. Next we move on to a very important structure which is a cochlear promontory. The promontory is basically a very prominent eminence occupying most of the central portion of the medial wall of the middle ear. This here, as you can see, this here is the promontory and what uh, it lies between the oval window over here and the round window over here. So this promontory, what it basically represents is the underlying basal turn of the cochlea and this promontory, it is grooved to accommodate the branches of the tympanic plexus. As you can see in the picture over here, you can see a nerve plexus formed over it 
This tympanic plexus is formed by the Jacobson's nerve and the branches of the sympathetic plexus around the internal carotid artery. So, this is all about the promontory. Next, we come on to the oval window. Now, oval window, as you can see, it is uh, situated superior and posterior. This here is the oval window, this region over here. It is located, situated in the posterior and superior to the promontory. Now, this niche is basically limited anteriorly and superiorly by the cochleariform process and posteriorly by the ponticulus and the pyramidal eminence. Now, the oval window niche is closed by the stapes footlet which is surrounded by the annular ligament. This is all you need to know for, all the, for the undergraduates there that oval window is closed by the stapes footplate surrounded by the annular ligament and dimensions are about 3.25 mm long and 1.75 mm wide. This uh, oval window it is situated in a depression called the fossa vestibuli. Now you can see in the picture over here this here is the oval window and the depression that it is lying on is called the fossa vestibuli. So, this fossa vestibuli is surrounded by four walls. The upper wall is formed by the facial nerve canal over here. The lower wall is formed by the promontory. Anterior wall is formed by a part of the cochlear form process over here. And posteriorly, it is formed by the bony lamella of the medial wall of the tympanic cavity. So, this is all about the oval window that you need to know. And lastly, the, the last structure of the medial wall is the round window. As you see over here, this is here is the round window. It is in this picture, it is uh, more prominent. This here is the round window. You can see how it is located posterior and inferior in comparison to the promontory. And this round window is covered by a round window membrane. So, this completes all of the structures and the uh, structures which are forming the different boundaries of the medial wall. The Last of all is the superior wall of the middle ear cavity. The superior wall is basically formed by a plate of bone which is known as the tegment tympani. Now, this, uh, this bony wall, it separates the middle ear cavity from the overlying middle cranial fossa and the temporal lobe of the cerebrum. Now, the importance of the tegmin is that the integrity of the tegmin is very important to avoid any spread of infection from the middle ear to the intracranial cavity as well as it is also preventing the herniation of the brain into the middle ear. Now, coming to the different parts of the tegmin. So, the part of the tegmin tympani, tegmin sorry, the part of the tegmin which is overlying the eustachian tube is known as a tegmin tubari over here. This here is the eustachian tube. Next, the part which is lying all over the tympanic cavity is known as a tegmin tympani. And lastly, the part which lies over the mastoid antrum is known as the tegmin antri. So, the superior surface of the tegmin, it forms a part of the middle cranial fossa floor and it is covered by dura whereas the inferior surface of the tegmin is lined by the middle ear mucosa. So, the tegmin is basically separating the cerebrospinal fluid superiorly from the air space of the middle ear inferiorly and it is formed by the tegmental plate of the petrous bone and the horizontal plate of the squamous bone. Now, there are uh, this suture that you need to know about the petrosquamous suture. Petrosquamous suture is basically the suture line in between the petrous part of the temporal bone and the squamous part of the temporal bone. The importance of the suture is that in newborns the suture is not ossified and it is filled with connective tissue. So, by adulthood this suture is closed. So, what happens is in, in some cases it might be that the dura of the middle cranial fossa it gets tightly adherent to this suture. So, sharp deception may be required for elevation of dura at this level when we are approaching via the middle cranial fossa approach. And at the level of the fusion between the tegmental plate and the anterior limit of the horizontal plate, there is a structure which is known as the cog. Now, I already told you about the cog. What is cog? It is a 0.5 millimeter long coronally oriented transversal hard and dense bony crest 
projecting from the tegment tympani above and situated 1 to 2 mm anterior to the malleus head and heading vertically towards the cochleriform process. Now this cog is actually separating the anterior epitympanic recess from the posterior epitympanum. So if you see in the picture over here, this here is the cog. You can see it's a sharp bony projection from the tegment tympani which is situated 1 to 2 mm anterior to the malleus. This here is the malleus head. So this is what is doing, it is dividing the attic into an anterior and a posterior epitempanum. The tegment, also what we need to know is about the slopes of the tegment. The tegment is not actually a simple horizontal bone. It is an irregular plate of bone with undulating slopes. There are two distinct slopes. One is, uh, one is oriented from lateral to medial direction and another is oriented from anterior to posterior direction. So in lateral to medial direction, the tegmin presents an inferiorly directed hang before reaching up to its highest point above the superior semicircular canal. You can see in the picture over here how from lateral to medially it goes down and then again it goes high up just above the lateral semicircular canal sorry superior semicircular canal so this is the slope in a lateral to medial direction and secondly in the antero posterior direction the tegmin shows a descending slope from and posterior towards the anterior so these are the two slopes you need to remember why this is important is mostly for postgraduates when you are approaching uh, uh, when you are doing mastoidectomy you need to be uh, remembering the different slopes from different angles. So you do, do not end up injuring the middle cranial fossa and the dura and the temporal lobe that lies above it. So this finishes up my topic on the boundaries and the different parts of the middle ear. Now uh, next in my next class I will be covering about the contents of the middle ear. So thank you all of you for watching and I will be seeing you in my next video.